All right. Hey, everyone. Joined here by Patrick, uh, tokenomics expert. Patrick, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. I'm just going to jump right into it. There's a lot of factors that determine the success of a project, the success of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the list goes on. What would you say are some of the biggest factors that determine the success of a project? Uh, the team and the uh, tokenomics are definitely really big on the list. Uh, nowadays, uh, also the utility. Why are people going to be still using the technology in five to ten years? Uh, that's something that along the way since Bitcoin, there was a pretty big kind of bad path of uh, a project like went into a, one direction that was more for cash grab and trying to finance themselves and they make quite a lot of mistake along the way and now everybody are trying to replicate the same kind of tokenomic pattern but we, we already went into the wrong direction in my opinion so so things needs to be fixed in order to get better You've su successfully launched your own projects, and you're also an advisor to a lot of the projects within my community, specifically around tokenomics. So this is an area that is uh, very important to you. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of challenges that a lot of projects are, are faced with when creating their tokenomics? Yes. Yeah, so right now what's uh, big on the topic is the to be sec compliant and we can discuss a bit uh, more of that but the other thing is that ever since bitcoin and ethereum like uh, from the early days of the crypto industry now like th there's been incentive that people got used to it when buying into crypto and then when you get those ten thousand percent return within a few years sometimes a few months it's really hard to sustain for the long run. So what project don't realize is that there's that aspect of network effect that gives it that FOMO early on to scale massively. So you get a lot of speculators that come in to, to projects and they are not planning to be real customers or users of the technology. They're just there to benefit financially and then sell. So they are not really loyal customers. And a lot of projects ended up giving a lot of money to those people. So now there's that kind of a really bad incentive to get early on project. And it's really hard to sustain. Because once you reach the peak and then those speculators start to, de to, to live, there's a financial incentive to live the economic of the system and come back later if you're a real customer or not come back at all. So a lot of projects are basically shooting themselves in the foot, trying to give financial incentive to attract early adopters. And the problem right now is that even the VCs and the investors backing project are expecting that super high return and basically launching a project with a really large community from the start. So all of those organic growth over time, starting small and growing like a, at a decent speed but growing organically it's gone from the market the investors don't want it the project don't want it but then it's really hard to find project that will sustain because of this because there's that network effect that scale really rapidly and then financial incentive come crashing down with the negative network effect it's really hard to prevent that from happening when you look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of the other top um, crypto, uh, Binance, uh, you name, you know, the list goes on, of course, they're all different in terms of technology. But what are some of the things that really stick out to you from a tokenomics perspective that makes you feel like, okay, they did it the right way. This is, I can see why this worked. Yeah. So... Bitcoin was very different in terms of tokenomic compared to Ethereum because there was a fixed supply and what gave it a lot of value was that aspect of scarcity because it came out at a time where the US government was printing a lot of money, US currency. So people realized that, hey, that, that's a problem in the long run because it created a lot of inflation. So now they wanted to have a system where 
the amount of tokens or like it was a fixed supply basically so as adoption grew that's what gave it that uh, kind of financial incentive to be there early as much as possible uh, because then like if you have uh, you know 100 million people using bitcoin compared to 10,000 the value of the bitcoin increased a lot because it's a fixed supply so you have to basically spread it through the the, the economy Meanwhile, Ethereum didn't have a fixed supply. So the tokenomic aspect of saying that scarcity was the ultimate way of doing tokenomic was not really true. Because even if you have scarcity, if you don't have market adoption, scarcity alone is not what's going to drive price increase or financial performance. So the truth is that your market adoption needs to be greater than the selling pressure. This is... It's the laws of supply and demand, basically. So nowadays, Ethereum has gone deflationary because they have added that burning mechanism and the burning is now uh, actually greater than the minting process. But there's multiple ways to solve this uh, issue. One thing that was common between two the two projects is that they didn't allocate a lot of tokens to the team or to early investors and, and so on. So the, the network grew organically over time by the mining process. And this is what a lot of mistakes come into play nowadays, is that a lot of projects are trying to finance themselves with the token economy, and they are selling token to investors at a very low price. And that also creates a problem, because now they are basically labeled as security because of this. So th there's project once in a while that you come out on the market and you see that they are launching without token allocation to the team or to early investors. So now the, those projects are financed through investors, but through selling equity of the business behind the project. And that's a much better way to do it. Uh, one big trend also that is actually starting to emerge is that you don't want tokenomic alone. You want revenue that feed into it, like real revenue. This is much easier to accomplish when you're a crypto exchange like GMX and other like uh, kind of decentralized exchange like this. But regardless of how you're building your project, if there's a reason why there's revenue that come into play, th that's much better. Right now, one of the most revenue generating network is Ethereum. Like I think it's about $6 million a day of revenue that is being generated. So that's a lot of money that, that go and can flow through the system. So ideally, you want something like that. Um, so I'll, I'll take a break and I'll let you ask another question because I'll, otherwise I'll go on and on. So. No, no, this is, this is very interesting. One of the things that you pointed to was you know, the, the proof of work for uh, Bitcoin and for Ethereum, which uh, largely was a reason why uh, you know, a lot of the tokens were not just handed out to early investors. Uh, cool. Do you see that proof of work is more, um, I guess, the, the more dominant way of providing consensus rather than proof of stake? Can, can you still have a project proof of stake and be successful? Uh, I prefer proof of stake, just in, in question of if, you know, the burning electricity just for the sake of burning electricity to me i've never been a big fan of that yes it makes the the project more secure the network more secure and right now that's one of the major point for sec compliancy is uh if people are awarded token because they are mining it it's not like they are making uh, the proof of stake kind of like make it so that it can be attacked by the sec as a security because you're giving dividends because you're putting your money to work not yourself or your hardware and so on but even with that said i still prefer a proof of staking mechanism that is done in a way that you're converting your time or your knowledge or things like that i've seen some project where if you are basically like a, a token review platform basically so let's say that you say that caspa is great and you make a review then you're awarded token because of your review. And when people upvote you, it's basically a proof of stake. So that I, I really like because 
the proof of stake is that you are making a conscious effort converting your knowledge in what is like good you're basically tagging information kind of like if you're on netflix and when you like a, a show or you watch a show you are essentially making a proof of stake things like that is a, a really good way to to make it so that it's sec compliant because you're converting your knowledge and your time into valuable kind of tagging of information for other users to benefit from uh, when it's proof of stake and you're just putting money to generate more money this is a bit more skittish in terms of being sec compliant but to me it's a lot better efficient like energy efficient method of securing a network so i like both uh, what i don't like is again giving token for free to people as their drop or to give them a significant discount to finance a project i think you projects should still finance themselves by selling equity in the business itself uh so you you mentioned projects that are given out tokens are there any other red flags that you can think of where if you evaluate the te tokenomics you can make the assumption that you know the this project is just trying to look for a cash grab the thing if you see a vesting period that is really short uh, especially with like let's say a 15 or 20 percent unlock at tge itself you can pre pretty much expect the team to not stick around for too long a lot of project and teams go on from project to project so imagine uh, mark zuckerberg launched facebook and a year or two later he was gone working on something else who would be taking care of facebook in some case there's a foundation and people who can take over but a lot of project once the money has dried up and the token price is going down it's it's going to be really hard to incentivize people who were not there early on and this, there's a lot of knowledge that disappear that uh, you don't want disappearing so to me i've seen project where the team had a vesting period of 10 years this i was really excited and i'm much more tempted to want to finance and provide uh, to buy into those projects early on because i believe that the team will be there for the long run and think if you have a successful project why would the team just disappear anyway and move on i i, I think there's sure like as the size of the project increase sometimes there's better people to take it to the next step but uh it's always good to have the early funders being there for the long run because they started everything and i prefer that what would a 10-year yeah. vesting period what what would that even look like uh the thing you you get uh, a low amount of token every month ideally you don't want to get it in like super big chunk but if, if it's a daily vesting over the period of 10 years that means if the team move on those tokens will be allocated to someone else that take over you just need to make sure that it doesn't go to individual wallet but go into a multi-sig wallet to sustain the foundation or whoever is going to be the ecosystem supporting the project so yeah i i think it's preferable that way to think really long term especially if you're solving a real problem there's no reason why the project would not sustain you just have to tweak things here and there and make upgrades bitcoin is still getting upgrades it's not the same bitcoin that launched uh, like 13 years ago so you cannot just nail it from the very beginning things have to adapt to market condition so in other words when you're evaluating look for vesting periods that tend to be a little bit longer and that's usually uh not necessarily going to predicate success but it will you know say that the the, the team is uh very committed to the the project yeah exactly because the thing there's too many people who keep producing token every month and moving and you've seen it recently with uh on the new like base like you know the coinbase uh, network so someone created the bald token like as a meme coin and they it grew like four million percent in the weekend and then they rug pull after three days so obviously if it had the long versing period for the team token they would probably not have been able to do uh, to do that 
like that doesn't mean that it's always the the case you, maybe sometimes they say that it's there's a vesting and there's none but at least uh, yeah if it's not there at all i'm always a bit skittish so that's the thing about meme coins uh, you, you, you yeah. never know which one is has malicious intent or which one is going to be successful and will potentially you know take what they've been able to build and and do kind of like what Shiba is doing where now they have a layer two that they're coming out with Shibirium. You know, there's, yeah. there's all this other development that's happening beyond just a meme coin, but it all started with a very loyal community. So it, it, it's hard to tell, but perhaps maybe looking at the tokenomics is, is a way to be able to gauge whether or not a team is serious about what they're building. Yeah. Really for me, I pretty much never invest in meme coin. Because you know they are really not solving anything, and if they solve something, it may be later on. But at that point, is there still money in the bank? Because I think a lot of project, the money get flown to people's pocket, and then if they start to sell off, there's there's nobody there to maintain and build upgrade. So I guess Shiba was a slightly different use case, but uh, you you never know. Safe Moon was really popular not that long ago, and nobody hear about Safe Moon anymore. Yeah, I am. A lot, majority of these meme tokens, they're here one day, gone the next, for sure. Exactly. Let's let's transition the topic to gaming. You know, one of the biggest challenges for uh, a lot of games in Web3 has been around uh, retaining users. And a lot of that has to do with the actual user experience. But yeah. talking to a lot of the projects, I also hear about, you know, having a sustainable economy, creating, you know, tokenomics review, how much does tokenomics play into the success of the overall game? Yeah, so again, in this case, I think tokenomic alone is just one part of the equation. For gaming projects specifically, uh, you know, they tend to, it's a, it's a really long tail market, the gaming market. And specifically for game, you need to attract users players that will be spending more than they earn. If everybody come to play the game expecting to earn more than they spend, the econ regardless of the economic model, it's not going to be sustainable. You need somewhere someone who will spend more uh, because they just enjoy playing the game itself. So all of the early prototype of gaming project, they were not built with really good budgets. Like to build a AAA games, we're talking about fifty million dollar or more. Like if you're targeting the hardcore gamers. So, meanwhile, you can also build a gaming project that doesn't cost as much, but you need it to target a different crowd. For example, there are uh, games that targeting women, and in this case, the budget required is much less. Like uh, Candy Crush would be an example. You can have quite a profitable game economy with women as your target customers and those games tend to be a lot less sophisticated because they appeal to the different crowd with a lot less competition. But the AAA game that targeting hardcore male gamers, so much competition. It's, uh, you need to put a really large budget there. Otherwise, uh, look into gambling and casino type of projects. I've seen one uh, roll bit. I didn't good, take a good look in the economic, but just today it has increased 56%. So gambling project, because of it's, it's really hard to regulate because it's worldwide. And this is not also, uh, it's a segment of the market that you don't need to put really large budget for the games. So I would look into that as well. Yeah, I remember that there was one project that was pretty successful during the last bull run. I think it was called Poker with a L. Uh, and they, they they were pretty big at the conferences. They had a very large booth, but I don't know if they were able to survive during the uh, yeah. bear market. So I don't know if they have enough users to actually sustain themselves. I think it's... Even if you have enough users, if the users, the only reason why they play the game is to earn more so that they can spend to pay their rent, it's eventually the economic will fall on itself. So you need you need people who will spend more. And uh, they need, they, you need a game that will attract them 
so for the entertainment itself so well to play the devil's really advocate that. patrick what about yeah. axie infinity which you know during the lock covid lockdown a, a lot of people especially in southeast yeah. asia this is how they were making their money they were playing the game yeah. and it created a very successful game um i mean what what would you say to to that when it comes to axie infinity the thing it, it did collapse in itself and they they received a lot of funding because they were the first of their uh, crowd so they got a lot of funding from private investors and right now they are what they're doing is interesting right now but axie itself the original game cannot stay the way it is they need to start building real quality game if they want to to attract and retain customers otherwise they'll be fighting with the Fortnite of this world. The, it, it's a next evolution. Games that want to attract those crowd of people need to, to make really quality game with good game mechanics, good graphics. And uh, so you need to make sure that you don't reward your users too much so that it doesn't collapse on itself. How far away are we from having that type of game that can be successful? I'd say a year or two, because a lot of the, when the Axie peaked uh, in 2021, a lot of game studio uh, received like massive funding, more than $50 million. And it takes time to build those games. So they are working on those games right now. And they w some of them will come out in a year or two. So I think it's just a matter of time. What vertical are you specifically interested in right now? You have gaming, you have NFTs, you have yeah. DeFi. Is there one specific area that is really catching your attention right now? Uh, to me, I, I would go for SEC compliant tokens, whether they are full security or the unknown security at all. Uh, because I think uh, once the institutional uh, investors come into this, this market, they will there's not much choice for them to invest. There will be Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a few others. But if you give them more choices, it will be nothing for them to put uh, you know, a few million dollars in a, a low cap uh, project. So I think it's uh, there's a big opportunity there. Anything that has to do with tokenizing real uh, world assets is probably good. Whether it's you could tokenize SaaS company, e-commerce company, and then the users and the customers of those companies can become part of the web three economy to me that's that's all pretty good uh, to consider that i think uh, the ai narrative is interesting but right now there's a lot of people who just slap buzzword of ai and if you are putting ai onto a crypto economy is there a real advantage or not so BitTensor is a project that to me is interesting because you can take existing AI model that you built uh, with TensorFlow and then you can run them on the blockchain uh, with BitTensor. So this, you don't need to refactor your code base. So that's much more interesting than trying to build AI on top of uh, uh, Singularity Net, for example. Because th this you would have to recode it from scratch, basically. So yeah, th there's quite a bit of opportunity there, but I think the good project might not even be on the market just yet. Render is making a lot of traction. The graph is a project I'll look into for sure, but I, I think a lot of the AI projects are just not even on launched yet. So we'll have to see them uh, coming up soon. Meanwhile, social fi, if we're talking about game fi, I would say social fi is interesting because the cost of developing application is a lot less, but you cannot just uh, fight uh, Twitter or YouTube or Facebook add-on. So one of my project is uh, a monetization platform for social media users. Uh, it's called finance.io. So th this that's why I put my time there because I compared to building a AAA game that require a $50 million budget, I can build a social fire project with a hundred thousand dollars budget and i think it might do good but you cannot just uh, fight the big boys uh, directly and so how are you yeah. i was just gonna ask how are you differentiating yourself from the mainstream social media platforms 
Uh, the thing we don't host content, we are purely a monetization platform for the content creators and the social media users. Basically, when the social media users are following a content creator, we are doing it in a proof of stake mechanism. So this way, the followers can start making money when the content creators start to grow their customer base uh, and all and so on. But uh, compared to other project uh, in the X to earn uh, category. We are doing market making to our own token, and this is where we make a lot of money. And uh, this is how we are able to sustain the economy to not give out more than we generate per day of income. Uh, and with that said, the content creator with a thousand followers on our platform should generate about 10 to 100 times what they would make on an existing social media platform. So they can still produce the content on Twitter or YouTube and so on, Instagram but they come on our platform to monetize specifically. I think that's a very important piece. Uh, I think in order for for the platform to have success, it doesn't necessarily need to replace the other platforms, but that's really uh, hard. Work I've, in, I've seen too many Web3 projects trying to fight Facebook add-on. The, the network effect are just, you would need to do it very differently. And right now there's just so many kind of uh, social media platform. It, it, I, don't, I don't know if there's that much space left. So so I, I don't think fighting oh, them is the right way. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. Uh, Patrick, yeah. we learned a lot today talking to you about, uh, you know, the tokenomics, uh, looking for some red flags in terms of what looks like a money grab, uh, some of the key areas that you're focused on and some of the projects that you're working on. Any parting thoughts for the listeners? Uh, but one category of token that I'm very interested in, and I know only two occurrence of that is what I call stable growth token. Because right now, you know, there's $180 trillion currently sitting in bank account worldwide that is business deposit. It's the treasury of businesses. That money will never come to crypto as long as the volatility is, is what it is. We can say that Bitcoin is a st store of value. It is if you have a time horizon of 10 years, but it's not a store of value if you need to pay your supplier and your employee next month because the fluctuation are just too, too much. So we need right now something that is between a stable coin and an altcoin, something that has a bit of volatility but not too much and something that grew a bit because US currency is not a proper store of value either long term. It's a good mode of transfer when you do commerce. But if you have a million dollar in the bank account for the next 10 years, you're losing to inflation massively. So we need something in between. And right now, there's, there's only two occurrence that I know of that, but we need a lot more. Uh, we need basket of commodity, orange juice, milk, and so on as a basket of commodity because uh, that's another thing that grew relatively at the speed of inflation. I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in that uh, regard. So let's see. Interesting take. Yeah, I, I haven't really even thought about having uh, eggs digitized. <laughs> Yeah, but eggs alone you can't. But if it's a basket of food commodity that are the basic necessity of life, that uh, I think makes sense. Because individual uh, uh, food item can fluctuate a lot, but as a basket, uh, it's very stable growth. Yeah, I was I was thinking of eggs because of just how much it's yeah. it's grown in price. Um, yeah, exactly. With, <laughs> over the last few months, Patrick, where can people find more information about you? Uh, my Twitter is a good place. Uh, so crypto rookies, uh, crypto underscore rookies. But I'll let you put in the description of the video. And also my medium, my medium, I publish like 16 blog posts about economics and like uh, more recently grid bots trading and so on. So that's a good place to see uh, some of my work there. Uh, and I'll have a book coming up on economic uh, pretty soon. So we'll see how it goes. We'll definitely have to have you back for that. And your content is always valuable. In fact, you know, when you post some of that content in our community, some of the projects that you are advising uh, have reached out to me initially to connect with you because of that content. So yeah. 
I appreciate the uh, the value that you provide, not only to the community, but to everyone around the world that is interested in learning more about crypto. And I think the better we can become educated, the better we can move forward uh, in this industry. So thanks again for all yeah. your hard work. It's a pleasure.